Thank you all for coming tonight to tonight's presentation, Parking 2.0. My name is Matt Tebow, and I'm with Health ICT, and we are extremely excited to bring in internationally renowned expert on parking and transportation, Jeff Tomlin. We're excited to learn how parking impacts health, our economic viability as a city, and transportation. So everybody know so everybody knows there this presentation will be recorded and it'll be available on Health ICT's website and Facebook page after this. So if you would like to go back and view it, if you uh, had questions about something that you think you missed, it'll be on there, or if you'd like to share it, it'll be on there as well. I'd also like to say there will be a time for question and answers at the end of the presentation. So if you have any burning questions, please save those till the end and Jeff is happy to answer those. Um, I would like to take a moment to thank our partners for putting on this event. I would like to thank the Health and Wellness Coalition of Wichita, the Wichita Area Metro Planning Organization, Downtown Wichita, and Visual Fusion for their support in making this event come to fruition. I would also like to thank the Wichita Art Museum for letting us host this in a beautiful facility and for being so accommodating to us. And I would also like to recognize and thank Council Members uh, Fry and uh, Claycomb for being present today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, Jeff Tumlin. Jeff is the Principal and Director of Strategy at Nelson Nygaard and is an expert in transportation and parking issues and in helping communities move forward from discord to agreement about the future. For more than 20 years, Jeff has led award-winning plans in cities from Seattle and Vancouver to Moscow and Abu Dhabi. He helps balance all modes of transportation in complex places to achieve a community's wider goals and best utilize their limited resources. He has developed transformative plans throughout the world that accommodate millions of square feet of growth with no net increase to motor vehicle traffic. So without further ado, help me to welcome Jeff. Thank you. Take it, Mr. Nunn. Ah, there we go. Maybe a little too loud. Uh, so good evening. Uh, this is amazing. Almost a full house on a beautiful Tuesday evening to sit here for an hour listening to me rant about parking. Uh, that's <laughs> astonishing. Um, so apologies in advance. This is going to be long and nerdy and tedious. Uh, I'm also going to be making a lot of references that come from places like California, where I'm from. So um, I live in San Francisco now. Uh, but I grew up in the suburbs of Los Angeles, and it's the sort of place where I got my driver's license on the morning of the day of my 16th birthday. Uh, and I uh, worked multiple jobs while going to high school um, in order to be able to buy my own car when I was 17, and I've owned a car ever since. And I have a deep emotional attachment to my little vehicle. Um, I really love it, and um, as a motorist, um, there are few things that I love more than an empty parking space. But as somebody who cares about municipal economics, I also know that every empty parking space is a wasted $20,000. Parking is expensive to build. It's an incredibly valuable capital asset. And a key theme of this entire presentation is about the responsibility that government has to steward limited taxpayer resources in a way that delivers value to the community they serve. Um, and this means paying as much attention to how we manage parking as we do to how we supply it. And it also means paying attention to some of the unintended consequences of our best efforts to create a functional parking system. So all cities need parking, particularly downtowns. Um, it's really, really important to supply parking. But sometimes oversupplying parking is a worse problem than undersupplying parking. So uh, Wichita, outside of the downtown, has minimum parking requirements. In most cases, that's about three parking spaces per 1,000 square feet. Um, and we call it in those terms because if we mandated a minimum number of square feet of parking spaces per square feet of land use, we'd quickly realize that if you're requiring more than two spaces per 1,000, 
you're requiring more space for the car than for people and all the economic activity that's occurring inside your building. So something that we do sometimes to torture our clients is to convert their minimum parking requirements into minimum land area for the car compared to land area for people. Um, and that's one of the reasons why Wichita looks the way that it does. When we go back in history in Wichita, um, this is a fantastic um, map from 1887. So for Wichita's first 100 years, it knew that transportation was what created value. Wichita exists because it's the confluence of two rivers and at the confluence of a whole lot of railroads and roads. It exists because it's on the way to everywhere. And you know, there's this fabulous map, you may not be able to see it, uh, but you know, it says the peerless princess of the plains and the city of destiny and the commercial wonder and the eighth wonder of the world here in Wichita because it's at the confluence of everything. Transportation created value in this place. And if you look at you know, old historic aerial photographs of the downtown or the vibrant streetscapes, um, this is from 1936, overlooking your city. Can you see a parking lot? No, that is all economic activity. This is one of the most vibrant cities in the country in 1936. Um, and then something changed. In the post-war era, and there were good reasons for this. There were very good reasons for this. In fact, I would argue that the interstate highway system was one of the best investments this country ever made. It knitted this country together economically, and it created the opportunity for self-reinvention, right? You could get your goods to market, and you could move somewhere else and become an entrepreneur and get very rich. But we overcorrected in some ways while accommodating the automobile in the third quarter of the 20th century. Um, and the result is that if you look today at an aerial photograph of downtown Wichita, that um, about two thirds, three quarters maybe, of your city is set aside not for economic productivity, but for storage of cars. Um, and the result of that is that Wichita has lost cohesion. And the result of that is Wichita is having an increasingly hard time attracting and retaining young talent. Um, because survey after survey, and all of my big corporate clients are very conscious of this, um, younger, talented adults, people who have a choice of where they live, like places where there's some degree of walkability. Not an extreme degree. Not, they don't want to go from a place you know, that is all about cars to a place that bans cars. They want to be able to drive but not to be forced to, or they want to be able to drive to a place that's sociable um, and that's fun. And you're starting to piece that back together again, and so it's a very exciting time, I have to keep adjusting this all night, it's a very exciting time to be here in Wichita because you're at exactly the right juncture point for reimagining your future again, more like that incredibly boastful vision that you had of yourself in 1887. So, Let's talk more about parking. Um, this is not Wichita. This is, I don't even know where this is, it's somewhere in Silicon Valley in California. It could be anywhere because most of the country looks like this. This could be Texas, it could be Virginia, it could be anywhere. And this is the perfect manifestation of this city's rules and regulations and street design manuals and zoning codes and minimum parking requirements. So this is a mixed use community. This is actually a mixed-use transit community. You can't really see it, but there's a light rail line. You know, there's, there's some residential over here, there's some shopping, there's some office, there's, I don't know what this building is, and every building has a parking lot attached to it. Um, this is the perfect manifestation of this community's values, making sure that if I'm going to this hotel, Oh goodness gracious, I better not be able to park across the street in somebody else's parking lot. But the result of this is that if I work here and I want to go to lunch literally across the street, I'm going to get in my car and drive across the street to get to lunch. Or if I'm staying in that hotel and I've got a meeting literally across the street, I'm going to get in my car and drive across the street. And as a result of that, Silicon Valley and you know, Northern Texas and 
Eastern Virginia have some of the worst traffic congestion problems um, in the world and some of the poorest return on investment for their transportation infrastructure. So we want to avoid this. We also want to understand um, this is less of a problem in Wichita. I'd be so jealous. You have, I don't want to get into San Francisco housing politics, but you have no idea how good you have it here. Um, particularly as a mechanism for attracting and retaining talented young people. And it's something that I tell young people who come to me for advice, do not go to the coastal megacities. Go to the heartland where you can actually not only be able to afford housing, but be able to advance your career by not being siloed professionally. Um, that's a whole other conversation, but a potential great strength that Wichita has. Um, but recognize that for every parking space that you build or require with a residential unit, you increase the price of that unit by about 15 to 20%, and you decrease the number of units that can be built on a typical parcel by about the same amount. Um, it also costs a lot to own a car. So a household that shifts from owning two cars to owning one car can afford an additional $100,000 in mortgage. Meaning that if you can go from a two-car household to a one-car household in Wichita, you can afford to buy almost any house within the center of the city. Like, that's amazing. Um, we know, you know in urban markets, um, the impact that bundling parking into the price of housing has on rent. It you know, increases rents by about $225 a month in a more urban market, probably less here. Um, and that these economic impacts vary by demographic group. Um, so black and Latino people own cars at a lower rate than whites do. So if you assume that everyone owns a car and you're going to bundle the price of parking into commercial and residential rent, um, you're basically creating a wealth transfer from your least affluent households towards your most affluent households um, and denying <coughs> low-income people the opportunity to break out of poverty because you're asking them to spend an ever greater, greater percentage of their household income on mobility. We also know that um, in commercial districts um, that uh, typically, we, th we think about an average of 30% of the traffic in most urban commercial districts is people driving around in circles trying to find a parking space. Um, and that congestion operates on a 10% margin. So in the most congested situation, if you eliminate just 10% of the vehicles, traffic flows smoothly again. So in most places with traffic congestion, not that that's a serious problem here, you can eliminate that problem simply through managing parking better. And this is particularly true here at special events when you do end up with significant traffic congestion. One of the reasons though why this particular capital asset is so strange, we manage it so poorly compared to other capital assets, is the weird psychology of parking. And I'm not really quite sure why this is true, but it is universal across cultures and genders and nationalities. It, it happens everywhere I go in the world where there's this really powerful association between parking and status. If you are a star employee, you don't get a raise. You get the front door parking space and people get really, really excited about that. It's just like, it's, it's the best. Um, and, you know, and it's true throughout our culture, and this is Kim Novak in the movie Vertigo, you know, like all Hitchcock blondes, if you notice in film, always park right at the front door of whatever store they're visiting. It's universal. Um, and people get really, really upset, particularly in residential neighborhoods, right? We all intellectually know that the street in front of our house, it's the public right of way. That's the publicly owned street. I have no control over the street in front of my house. <laughs> and like, it's not mine, it belongs to the public, like everything does. And yet, even I, who live in a city, like, who's that parking in front of my house? <laughs> Should I be concerned? Like, that's kind of a sketchy car. I don't recognize that car. Um, and, you know, in, in more suburban contexts, people, like, get really, really angry if strangers are parking in front of their house. Because for some reason, parking gets included in our, our 
very you know, tribal, territorial, human sense of territory. And so we can behave like a little weird when it comes to parking and get very, very angry and resentful in ways that we wouldn't under any other circumstance. I mean, how many of you have done something really dangerous while driving, right? I mean, I've done insane things and said things out loud that I would never say under any other circumstance. There's something about the unique kind of privacy and illusion of power that is conferred upon us by our automobiles that um, allows us to step outside of the social contract, right? It's only like on the internet when we're anonymous but public that we do even weirder things, right? <laughs> in cars and like, you know, in internet comments. So it's a very funny thing. And one of the things that we need to recognize as we start having a conversation about parking is that um, as Donald Choup, who's my favorite writer on this topic, I mean, have, any, have, have any of you read Donald Choup's High Cost of Free Parking? Oh, wow, this is a nerdy audience. Okay, good for you. Yeah, All right, excellent. So Donald Choup wrote this book, this book, The High Cost of Free Parking. It's like 600 pages long. It's insane. It's, it's not only the best, but the only funny book that's ever been written about parking. And he has many great quotes, including the fact that all thinking about parking occurs in the reptilian cortex of the brain. <laughs> right? The prefrontal cortex, the, the part of the brain that allows us to think through the consequences of our actions, that is shut down as soon as we talk about parking. Like, this is a unique topic that literally drives us crazy. And oftentimes, what I find is that people who are really upset about parking Parking is simply a proxy for unrelated fear and anxiety. Parking is the thing that we're allowed to complain about when we're not allowed to complain about something else, like a different type of people moving into my neighborhood, or I'm getting older and I'm feeling out of touch, or a lot of change is happening and I'm feeling left behind. Right? There's a lot where parking becomes the flashpoint for unrelated, built-up anxiety and tension in a community. And we need to accept that, right? There's no way to have a really rational conversation about parking. Um, and that's OK. So there are ways, though, that we can move forward. So let's talk about some of those. One of the first places that I start is there's a sort of an assumption, like parking is super important. It's really valuable. You need it in order for places to be successful. So if some parking spaces are good, more parking spaces are better, right? And that there's this linear relationship between parking supply and value. That, you know, the more, the better. When in reality, what we find is that whether you're talking about traffic capacity or parking supply, value is on a bell curve, where at a certain point, whether you're having roads that are so wide that they're difficult to cross, or so many parking spaces that there's no longer a place to go to anymore, because it's all parking, that your value goes deeply negative. The trick is figuring out how do you get and stay at the top of the bell curve? And more importantly, how do you find that right balance between <coughs> supply and management. How do you take your existing supply and manage it optimally as the very expensive capital asset that it is? Recognizing that Wichita is right now over here. You've got probably twice as much parking as you will ever need as a community. Um, and what you've done is exported land value from your city to the suburbs. Parking hasn't created value, which should be its job. The purpose of building parking is to create value. Instead, what you've done here is exported value by overbuilding and under-managing. So let's talk a little bit about management. So one of the first places to start is to protect the status quo, to protect the incumbent. You're not going to be able to have a rational conversation about these difficult issues unless you can assure your existing residents and your existing business owners that they're not going to be harmed in the process of change. So a place where many communities start, and I don't even know if this is really necessary, but 
Something that you should enable, at least legalize, is creating um, residential parking permit districts. So if you've got existing residents in single family homes that are concerned about change going on next door, protect them by forbidding outsiders from parking on their streets. This is anti-market, it's anti-democratic, it's like bad communism. But it may be what's necessary in order to be able to have a conversation about smart parking management in a part of your community that's developing and changing is protecting the parts of your city that are not changing. And that's, that's okay. Um, I grant you, there's no hard and fast rules at all in the world of parking, except focus on outcomes, be clear about what your local values are, um, and manage those outcomes, and continually adjust, right? There's no rules here. It's all about what is gonna allow your city to move forward. One rule though, actually, I'm this, at first I say there's no rules, and then like, actually there are some rules. Um, so, I'm not from here. I drive into Wichita. It's not possible for me to pay for parking in Wichita. Um, so, in my wallet, I, I'm a wealthy guy, I've got plenty of money. Uh, in my wallet, let's see, I've got credit cards, right? <laughs> Uh, and because it's what ATMs give me, um, I've got $20 bills. Parking meters and your weird little, like, little stuff it in the box technology <laughs> from, like, 1932 <laughs> requires that I either have quarters or $1 bills. I do not have either. So, I'm a criminal in Wichita. Or, I'm just told to leave. So, the first place where we start this conversation is recognizing that the only reason you should be charging for parking is to make sure that customers can find a space. Parking is entirely about, at least in a commercial district, it's entirely about commercial success. It's an extension of your customer service strategy. And if any business on Douglas were to require that I pay only in quarters or $1 bills, they would quickly go out of business. Your parking meter technology, it's from the 1970s. Your parking meters must accept credit cards. More importantly, um, you should, all of your parking spaces that are managed, I should be able to pay with my cell phone, and my cell phone should be able to message me, uh, like, hey, your meter's about to run out, do you want another hour? Oh, yes I do, because I'm having a good time in Wichita. As opposed to your current strategy, which is to say, like, Okay, so I'm here from outside, like I'm in Wichita, and there's not like, really much to do in Wichita, right? So like, I'm not going to be here for more than an hour, right? So you know, I put in my quarter, and I go, I'm like, oh, wow, Wichita is awesome. There's all this great stuff. You've got the pop-up park, and there's these alleys, and there's Old Town, and there's all these great restaurants. And like, it's great. I've had a fantastic time. I've spent five times as much money and twice as much time as I was planning. And I come back to my car, and I'm literally criminalized, right? I have a criminal citation for overstaying parking, like not good customer service. So the place where you start is with technology. It's your friend now. Uh, the stuff is cheap, it used to be expensive, it's now, there's kind of no excuse. Um, you're actually better off just mismanaging your parking than driving customers away with your 1970 meter technology. Uh, the other thing that smart meters do is they give you great data uh, that allow you to see how your system is performing over time. Um, there's no more powerful tool for building trust with skeptical merchants and citizens than collecting data and reporting back on how government is doing, right? This is a fundamental responsibility of government is continually demonstrating that they're using your limited taxpayer dollars in a way that's creating a high return on investment, that they're managing the resources wisely. We have limited street right of way, we have a limited number of parking spaces, parking spaces are expensive, and manage them well. Also recognize that there are other technologies that are out there that make it a lot cheaper to help motorists find the thousands of empty parking spaces that always exist than it is to build new supply. You've got so many empty parking spaces here, why are you building any new parking spaces when you can just tell people, hey, block away, 
500 empty spaces, free, you can go there. Or why not invest, rather than in building new parking spaces, plant some trees on your street so that when it's 100 degrees in the summer, it's comfortable to walk a block or two from the <coughs> Why not invest in a quality pedestrian environment and lighting and pop-up stores so that if I'm a woman walking back to my car at night, that I feel reasonably comfortable. There's nothing magic about the right number of parking spaces. There is something magic about a safe, convivial, walkable place. Invest in that before you invest in more parking supply. Um, and you know, you can put all this stuff online, all of these things, the price of this has come down to the point where for the price of one parking space, you can buy some of these technologies. Then, at a certain point, it comes time, like if you're an actually successful place, particularly in your downtown, yes, you may need to charge for parking. Um, again, the only reason you should charge for parking is to create the right availability for your customers. Um, and you should never, as a city, look at charging for parking as revenue. Um, that's the worst path to go down. If you're looking at it as revenue, you're going to overcharge for parking, and that will result in fewer customers. Um, if you undercharge for parking, people will drive around in circles and eventually give up, and that will result in fewer customers. Your task here is to maximize the number of customers who can come downtown and maximize their spending. You will make far more money off of a successful commercial district than you will ever make off of your parking meters. So, what this means is figuring out when is the right time to charge for parking, and then how much to charge, and how. So, um, and the trick is availability. Your goal should be making sure that there's always one or two spaces available on every block, in every parking lot, and in every parking garage at all times of day or night. One or two, about 10 to 15% availability should be your target. Um, and if you've met that target already, if there's availability out there, the right price for parking is free. It's okay, you don't have to charge for parking. Or if you're not quite meeting the target because employees are parking there all day, then put up the two hour or one hour time limit sign. Problem solved. If you still don't have availability, then yeah, the next thing that we do is charge. Because we're Americans, we live in a market society, right? Except for the fact that this one commodity, we've tended to socialize, parking, right? Food, clothing, housing, your utility bill, your electricity, your cell phone, all of those other commodities, we use the market to balance supply and demand. For parking, we use time to balance supply and demand rather than price. We make people drive around in circles. This is the Soviet communist method of goods management. I don't know why this is our only communism in the United States. Like, we've, we have not socialized healthcare, but we have socialized housing for cars. That's, that's another one. So, all right, getting back to the point though. The right price for parking is always the lowest price that ensures that there's always one or two parking spaces available. The right price for parking is always the lowest price that ensures one or two spaces are available on every block, in every lot, and in every garage at all times of day. Um, and that's because if you charge more than that, you would drive customers away and you'd make less money. If you charge less than the lowest price that achieves the availability target, all your spaces would be full, people would drive around in circles and get fed up, and you'd lose customers. So the right price is always just the lowest price, and this is how the market works for every other commodity. It's not that complicated. So ignore the revenue and say the right price is the lowest price that achieves your availability target. So what this means, though, is that the right price varies a lot. Um, the right price will be twice as much on Douglas as it is around the corner. The right price will be a quarter the amount in a garage as it is on street. Um, the right price will be uh, maybe a lot at lunchtime, but free on Saturday. 
Or if you're in an entertainment district, it may be free all day during the weekday, but it's expensive at 10 o'clock on a Friday night. So the rent price is the lowest price, and this means it needs to vary by geography and time of day. And this means you need data in order to manage this expensive capital asset. And there's a lot of cities that are doing that. This is a very small little downtown. This is Redwood City, California, which is the first city in the country to adopt a policy um, where council delegated to staff the responsibility for managing parking to an availability target. And that meant free parking at the big garage on the edge and very expensive parking, uh, well, 50 cents an hour on Main Street. <laughs> this was like, like the world was going to end charging 50 cents an hour on Main Street. Um, but this was the, th these were the numbers that got parking availability to work in downtown Redmond City, which unleashed a massive amount of economic development in this city, because suddenly the perception was it was an easy place to go. You just shifted the employees out three blocks in order to free up parking in the center for uh, shoppers and visitors. Uh, and anyone who was, for some reason, it was ideologically important to them that parking be free, there was an answer. Like, go to the county garage, it is literally three and a half blocks away. Problem solved. Um, it also means that in addition to parking varying by geography, um, parking price needs to vary by time of day. This is a picture of a parking meter uh, in Old Town, Pasadena, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. It's a nighttime um, restaurant entertainment district, and you can see the hours of operation are during the week, uh, 11 to 8 p.m., but on Friday and <coughs> Saturday nights, they charge for parking until midnight. Oh, and you'll notice um, that there's nothing in Leviticus that says that parking shall be free on Sundays. <laughs> um, the reason why parking is free on Sundays is because the meter operators have the day off, and they've had that since the 1950s. Also, in the 1950s, which was probably the last time you updated your parking management procedures, <laughs> stores were closed on Sundays. So, the, you know, this is sort of what you end up with, and Pasadena got away with this because 100% of the net revenue from the parking meters went back to the downtown business district, uh, which is another thing to think about. If parking revenue is not about revenue, but really about a successful district, be really thoughtful about where that money goes to. Because your merchants will always accuse you of being evil, money-grubbing bastards who hate motorists, right, if you charge for parking. Um, so just say, okay, fine, you all get all the money. And then, and, and then it suddenly you'll notice the conversation changes a lot. Because then it's really true that the reason you're charging is so that your commercial district thrives. You charge in order to support customers, not to hurt your customers. Um, so give them money back. And in you know, Pasadena, like they advertise that the parking meter revenue like goes to the street trees and the flower baskets and to steam cleaning the sidewalks every night. Like, it's immaculate. It's the, <coughs> it's the loveliest place. Um, it also, they do um, downtown ambassadors to help manage the homeless. So there's a lot of homeless people, but the antisocial behavior is kept under control um, through uh, inviting them into the social contract, right? Uh, other things to do are, uh, this is another suburban committee in California, there's lots of places that are doing this now, including here, right? You, you do parklets, right? Yeah, so uh, this is Mountain View where the city allowed the merchants to commandeer the parking space in front of their business to put cafe seating out in the parking lane. <coughs> people like thought this was crazy, like people were gonna die in traffic, and like the commercial business was gonna die because we're taking away parking spaces. Well, the merchants that did this, their revenue tripled. Um, and not only did the merchants who did this get significant net benefit, but the neighboring merchants that didn't do it got net benefit because of the visibility of people outside eating, right? We are social primates. Nothing is more interesting to us than other humans. Like, people who drive through are like, what's going Like, I thought this was a dead little downtown. Like, something's going like, honey, can we just park and you know, find out what's happening here? Like, this restaurant may be completely empty inside, but what's selling it is the people outside. Um, so once you start getting these basics in place, you can start thinking about your parking code. How are you regulating 
Um, and since uh, you know, the 1960s and 70s, we as a society regulate parking almost to the degree that we regulate pharmaceuticals. Um, I don't quite understand why in the building trades, like we pay more attention to um, you know, parking regulation than we do to fire safety. Uh, so uh, most cities, this one included, except in your downtown, have very detailed standards for the minimum number of parking spaces that a developer must build. Why government knows the right number of parking spaces to build better than a developer, I can't really tell you. Um, developers are actually really smart about figuring out you know, the, the quality of kitchen finishes and the number of bedrooms and whatever it is that their, you know, their target market is for. Developers are really savvy and they're also incredibly risk averse. Dovers would never underpark the building. The government doesn't actually need to intervene in the private development market in order for developers to remember, oh, oh, that's right, I knew there was something we forgot, we didn't include parking. Um, you don't actually need any minimum parking requirements. Increasingly, cities around the country, like Buffalo, New York, eliminated minimum parking requirements citywide. Fayetteville, Arkansas eliminated all commercial requirements, but most of these still have them, and they haven't really updated them probably since the 1970s. And they pulled their requirements. They either just copied their neighbors, or they pulled the requirements out of this giant home called the, I, the Institute for Transportation Engineers Parking Generation Manual. It's this huge thing, and it's like, nah, I lift it up. And then, like, there's all these different land uses. Yeah, like, you know, nunnery. <laughs> because in 1974 in Florida, somebody did a count at this like one nunnery and like got it in the manual. So yep, we've got data uh, about every obscure imaginable land use, and like it gets more fun. So this is fast food restaurant with drive-in window land use number 836, and you know that like there's a lot of data points, right? And they dutifully drew a line that related. Um, uh, gross square feet with peak parking spaces occupied, right? So as you know, as you you know, you have more building, you need more parking. Now, they drew this line this way. I don't like. I would think that if you were to draw a line, it would be better maybe this way. <laughs> um, what this tells us is that there's no relationship at all between building size and parking demand, and yet. They dutifully report the average parking demand rate of 9.95 parking spaces per thousand square feet. Like, not 10, 9.95. <laughs> In this math, there is not even a single significant digit, and yet it's reported out to three significant digits as if this were science. <laughs> Welcome to my world. And we know from the data of any community, you can go into the US Census data to show residential parking demand by census block group. And we see that for every single land use, parking demand varies more by location than it does by land use time. And it varies tremendously from one community to another. But rarely do communities collect their own data. They're copying some data from Florida in the late 1970s. Right? There are many things that are special and unique about Wichita, including the how parking demand varies geographically about your city. There are other things that it's not, and yet um, we think it's fine to use this giant manual when it actually, in fact, doesn't make any sense. So think about, do you actually need to intervene at all in the private development market to force developers to build more parking than the market would warrant? The only reason we have done that as a society is to deal with the scourge of people uh, going to one store and parking in front of a different store, which is how shopping malls work, it's how strip malls work, and it's how every successful Main Street in America works. This is how great places all work, and minimum parking requirements only serve to destroy great places by making sure that you've got a store, and then a parking lot that's three times the size of the store, and another store, and another parking lot. <coughs> so, I would argue that minimum parking requirements only create economic, social, and environmental harm. 
They, they serve zero public good, other than assuaging irrational fears of spillover parking. That's the only function they serve. And I would argue that if you actually wanted to care about public health and the economy and good stewardship of limited resources, then it makes much more sense to interfere in the private development market to establish parking maximums rather than parking minimums. That if you want a thriving community, you need to constrain the parking supply and right size it, as opposed to maximizing it at any cost. And increasingly, a lot of cities are doing that, including cities like small cities that know that their economic future is dependent upon a thriving Main Street. Main Streets need parking maximums and exceedingly well-managed parking supply in order to thrive. So think about that. Also, while you're building parking, make sure that it's designed well. So that's an enormous parking structure there. You wouldn't know it. It looks like a great building. Um, and in fact, you're getting some of the stuff right, like um, in Old Town, the garage there. It's, uh, you know, it's a giant kind of ugly garage, but from the front side of it, it doesn't destroy the quality and real estate value at the front. Uh, it means being very careful with things like driveways, uh, putting driveways out on uh, you know, uh, an important uh, walking street on Main Street, or putting driveways in such a way that you eliminate as much on-street parking as you create off-street. Like, this has resulted in no net increase in parking, just a privatization of parking. It also means being thoughtful about things like um, how parking is managed. Um, we tend to be big promoters of unbundling the price of parking, particularly from the price of housing, but also for commercial leases. Um, and you can do this by law. Um, you can forbid the private developer market from bundling one or two or however many parking spaces into the residential unit. So that if somebody has fewer cars, you don't force them to buy parking that they don't need. And if somebody has more than the average number of cars, they can actually rent parking for all of their cars. So unbundling parking from housing and commercial leases allows for self-selection, allows for people who want a more urban, walkable life um, and to have a car-like lifestyle to be able to afford to do so, and that's good. Um, right now, you're doing social engineering by forcing people to have exactly 2.3 cars per household. Um, it also means uh, if you're having minimum parking uh, requirements to allow developers flexibility for uh, how you physically configure that. You don't need every parking space to be independently accessible. You can cram more cars in through lifts and valet. Valet is, a, 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 in fact, a fantastic tool for Wichita, given the fact that you've got parking constraints in a very confined area and a hyper abundance of parking um, two or three blocks away. Um, so tools like universal valet that are managed either through um, your downtown district or through the city, where you allow people to uh, pull up to a valet stand anywhere in the commercial district, drop their car off, go wander around, do whatever they want to do, um, and then go onto their phone and have their car delivered to another valet stand on the other side of town. Uh, really easy to do in an incredibly effective way of dealing with a situation like you've got here. Um, encouraging car sharing. Uh, do you have a car here yet? Yeah. Do you? Trust oh yeah. So I was thinking, like, because it's a college town, you're at a, you're at the margin of whether um, that would work. Um, as downtown becomes increasingly residential, this is a great tool. Um, it makes no sense for me. To, I only own a car for sentimental reasons. Um, more often, when I have to go on a long trip, I just grab a car share or a vehicle in my neighborhood. Um, that is more comfortable to drive than my uh, crazy little vehicle. Um, so it's basically a neighborhood rental car. They're great. Um, and it makes it easy to be uh, like a two-person household with kids and only own one car because you can rent a car when you know, your wife needs the car on the weekend you're going someplace else. Pulling all this together, though, your challenge here, particularly on a street like Douglas um, or uh, elsewhere where you've got neighborhood commercial districts is creating what we call a park once environment. So this is Douglas or Central or whatever arterial it is that you've got in your community. And our typical way of 
managing land use and transportation is you have different land uses, and each land use has its own required parking, and you'll notice that it's three times the size of the building because that's what your code requires. Um, and then, you know, our typical lives, right? So, you know, we live in the edge of town, and we go, we, you know, have to drop our daughter off at school, and so that requires a parking space and complete chaos in the morning, as many of you know. Uh, and then you drop her off, and you go, you go to work, and you park, you get some work done, and then sometime in the afternoon, you've got to go pick your daughter up and take her to soccer practice. Because even though it's across the street, like, you don't want her walking across that street because it's scary. So you park there, you drop her off, you send her away. And then you go, you pick up some groceries, and you go and you pick her up, right? And this is, like, obviously, this is very condensed. Like, our real lives are much more spread out. But this is, like, most American daily lives is this. And it's a lot of driving around. It's a lot of parking. It's a lot of turning movements off of the arterial. This is a mess of traffic just to accommodate a basic daily life. So if you imagine a slightly different way of doing this. So you've got your main street, and then you've got a grid off that main street. And this is sort of old town, right? You've done this with old town. You've arranged a mix of uses on a grid of skinny, walkable streets. And you have some shared parking and some structured parking, so it's taking up less land area, significantly less land area. And you can drive and you can park, right, with your daughter, and now she can walk herself to school, if you remember to restore your downtown school, you'll get to that later, uh, while you walk to work, and now she can actually walk herself to soccer practice, and you can pick up errands in your lunch, and you can meet back in the car, and you can drive home. So this is the exact same trip as the previous trip. The exact same. Like, this isn't, like, there was no transit in here. This was all driving. And yet the impact of it is profoundly different. So the impact of arranging your land uses this way means you only need half the parking supply because that office building, that shopping, can share parking because it's peaking at different times of day. It means that it all takes up less than half of the land area, or you get twice as much economic performance per acre as you did in the previous scenario. Uh, it means a quarter of the arterial trips, less than a quarter of the vehicle miles traveled, or you need a quarter of the infrastructure and the maintenance that comes with that infrastructure compared to the other way of managing things. So again, I want to emphasize, this is no different. This, there's no transit. This is not anything crazy. This is how every small town main street in America works. And the result is profoundly net, economically positive, and super pleasant, um, and results in good returns from, from a health perspective, from an air quality perspective, from a household affordability perspective, and yet it is illegal in most cities in America. So um, let me run through really quickly. Um, this is not so relevant for you. This is the work that San Francisco did um, with SF Park. Um, San Francisco got $15 million from the Bush administration to try to manage parking better in one of the most parking challenged cities in the country. Uh, so it did some pilot projects in a limited number of neighborhoods, and it combined a bunch of things together. So it took smart meters that took coins and credit cards and pay by cell, um, and it uh, got really, really smart about charging for parking um, by three different time periods of the day, with parking most expensive at lunchtime. A little less, this is obviously a lot more expensive than anything you would charge um, for, in Wichita. And then it used data to increase um, by a quarter or decrease by a quarter um, the price of parking on every block and in every parking lot um, once a quarter for a year until everything met its availability target. Um, and the city did great mapping that it shared with all the merchants. Like, here's, you know, mapping of availability by day of week, blue being good, green being, like, spot on, red being too full. Um, and then it just, like, every quarter collected data and made price adjustments until, uh, eventually, uh, everything got uh, into the good zone. Um, what that meant uh, is that the data allowed them to be a little bit more efficient about enforcement, but they found that the ticket revenue um, was cut by about two thirds. Um, so ticket revenue plummeted, uh, which some people were concerned about, 
but meter revenue increased so that the <coughs> net revenue stayed almost exactly the same. But customers were a lot happier. Retail sales tax per block went significantly up. Uh, traffic adjustment was reduced. Transit travel time got improved. Um, and uh, you know, it was incredibly net positive. Um, you don't need $15 million from the Bush, Bush administration to put data hockey pucks underneath all of your parking spaces. Seattle took all of this information and thought, oh, that's a good idea. Um, how can we use the data that we're getting from our existing parking meters to calibrate price without the hockey pucks? Um, and they figured out a great way of doing that. And the result of that was that San Francisco took their $15 million worth of hockey pucks and threw them away. Um, realizing that they had enough data from their parking meters in order to make these adjustments, continue to make them over time um, without um, having to overmanage. All right, some final points about planning for the future. So, um, transportation attitudes are changing pretty rapidly. Um, and millennials hate being called millennials, and yet when we look at data about attitudes about transportation by age group, um, some of those attitudes are starkly different among younger adults. Um, uh, rate of people getting driver's licenses, way down. And this is occurring all over the country. More pronounced in urban places, but we're seeing similar trends in small towns in the heartland. A um, lot lower automobile ownership, partly because we've made young people really poor, uh, but partly because of attitudinal differences. Uh, real um, significant increases in mobility, technology, mobility alternatives, things like car share, Uber and Lyft are super popular among uh, urban adults, uh, young and young adults in small towns, particularly for evening and weekend trips. Um, most young people have figured out if they want to go out for the night, uh, a lot better to call Uber than to risk a DUI, and you can have a lot more fun. Um, and so things like car sharing and bike sharing, Uber and Lyft, are making mobility something that people are looking for rather than merely car ownership and parking. And it's changing the conversation. One of the things that I frequently tell my clients, particularly who are older adults, so most elected officials, they tend to be older than population average, is that you manage your city for your current population, but you plan your city for your future population. And if you want advice about how to plan for a successful future city, the kind of city where your grandchildren are going to want to continue to invest in, go talk to your granddaughters. And granddaughters in particular, um, because women overwhelmingly make the key decisions that drive successful places. Moreover, if you design for young women to be happy there, you'll design for everyone to be happy there. If it works for young women, it works for every single demographic group. So go talk to your granddaughters. Ask them what kind of a place do they want to live in. What would make them happy? What would make them want to stay? Because Wichita is just the greatest place to be. And they'll tell you, they're smart about this stuff. Um, and it may allow you to change your mind, because the stuff that we do around planning, this is a really long-term horizon. I mean, I'll be dead by the time you know, most of my work is even implemented. Um, I am planning for future generations. That means it's part of my responsibility to talk to younger people and find out what's going to work for them and watch the data on their behavior and to notice when that behavior benefits me. Guess what? If younger people are not driving as much as I do, it means I can drive more. <laughs> right? The best thing to solve parking problems and traffic problems is to get somebody else to not drive or park. Right? If all you care about is driving and parking, all this stuff is good for you too. And that's another funny thing that we find in the transportation world, is that when we start talking about changing the rules, somehow people think that like, government is going to sneak into their house in the dead of night right, and take away their car or force them to like, out of their home and force them to live in some horrible, awful, you know, crude Igo apartment building. 
No, this is enabling your auto-dependent lifestyle by accommodating other people's desire. So uh, another, uh, obviously, big change that is occurring is, is autonomy, autonomous vehicles. Um, most of the uh, analysis that we've done and that other institutions have done show that autonomous vehicles will probably eliminate about 80% of um, parking demand. So uh, to the extent that autonomous vehicles can go park themselves someplace else, or that they're not actually owned by you, that you simply call up the whatever vehicle you want, whenever you want it, and it takes you where you want to go, and then it goes and does something else, that it doesn't need to park. So uh, we're already seeing in the coastal cities rapid decline in parking demand simply as a result of Uber and Lyft. And this is particularly true evenings and weekends. We're starting to see it at other times of day as well. Uber and Lyft are a good predictor of what happens with autonomous vehicles. The autonomous vehicles are basically Uber and Lyft, but at a cheaper cost model. It's, it's like, you know, they're robot taxis. Um, as soon as you eliminate the driver, uh, it's the, the biggest significant cost. Um, you bring the cost of Uber and Lyft way down. Um, so the question that we're all struggling with is, okay, like this is it's kind of real. Uh, there's some remaining technological hurdles. When is this happening? Um, we have no idea. Um, and so we draw a lot of adoption curves, learning from other cur uh, technologies of adoption curves, like um, smartphones, which happen really fast uh, because they're cheap and really useful, uh, as opposed to things like the private automobile. Um, that happen slowly because it's expensive. Color TV, halfway in between, halfway in between absorption curve. So most of the people that I trust are actually thinking that the adoption curve looks a little bit more like um, color TV because the advantages are gonna be significant even though the cost is gonna be high. Um, but even so, the best, most optimistic thinking about 90% market penetration, it's likely still 30 years out. I mean, my car is um, over 20 years old. And like, you know, I'm not gonna trade it in for an autonomous vehicle. I, I like it, right? I'm attached to it emotionally. Um, so it's gonna be a while unless the government really interferes with the market because of the safety advantages of autonomous vehicles. A question that really remains to be seen given the recent Uber incident. Um, so I'll, an effective way of thinking about parking is asking the question, so if I'm building, particularly a parking structure that's a 50 year asset, is the debt going to be paid off in that structure uh, or not, right? If I've only got a 15 year useful life on this thing, will um, it pay for itself by the time it's functionally obsolete? So a lot of developers that we're working with are really nervous about this question. Um, even looking at a slow um, market penetration curve, um, because parking is such an expensive commodity. So you're asking questions like, okay, can I build a structure that is adaptable, that can be converted into something else? So should I have all the floors be level and have high floor to ceiling heights so that when it's no longer marketable as parking, I can convert it to residential or office? Or should I design it to be demolishable? Um, should I ever build underground parking ever again? I mean, my conclusion is that underground parking is done. Uh, it is just too expensive and not convertible to anything else other than one level of basement parking still makes sense because you can always there's always a need for basement storage but four levels of underground parking that anyone is doing that today is beyond me because it is so incredibly expensive so thinking about this these questions of convertibility adaptability demolishability or thinking about phasing your parking so that you accommodate, rather than accommodating 100% of your parking demand in structure, you convert maybe 40% in structure and 40% as surface lot that you can build on when it's no longer needed. And 20% is probably cheaper to pay people not to drive than it is to build a 50-year parking investment off of which you might get 10 years of revenue. Um, and that's something that many of our suburban employers are already finding. Uh, Genentech uh, in the suburban Bay Area pays its employees $7 a day not to drive because it was cheaper for them 
to pay their employees seven dollars a day not to drive than it was to build their fifth parking structure uh, at a significantly expensive cost. Um, Google um, has a 45% drive along rate in a location that has zero public transit. So Google's drive along rate in the like auto dependent suburbs is the same as the San Francisco drive along rate because Google invests in employee productivity and attraction and retention. They built a transit system. They send shuttle buses to places where their employees live, um, not because they care about traffic, but because it's cheaper for them to pay for shuttle bus drivers um, because they get an additional 45 minutes of productivity out of their employees. And it costs about $20,000 to hire someone in Silicon Valley, so it's a lot cheaper to invest in employee retention by making the commute less miserable by funding transit. So, final theme. There are many fantastic places about which uh, there are many things that are awesome about your assets. Um, it's actually a remarkable place. There's a whole long list of things that uh, city staff were taking me around today that showed that um, you're world class in a lot of funny ways. Like every like cool thing that the cool city kids are doing, like you can check pretty much all of those boxes. The remaining work that has to be done here is partly about cohesion. It's about taking all the great little stuff that's scattered around and bringing it together so that it feels like one great place. But the real work is learning from the successes of all these experiments that you've done and taking that to scale. It means being really clear about what your unique values are here in Wichita. And it's utterly fascinating to me as an American in 2018 that Wichita runs right on the fault line of every difficult social, political, economic issue in America. Your values are super important and unique. And if you can figure it out here in Wichita, we have hope for every other city in America. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's your task. You've got a critical challenge here in this town. My hope for like, uh, like allowing this country to move forward is for cities like Wichita to have a citywide conversation about exactly what are Wichita values, and then to look very carefully at all the mechanics of governance and make sure that those mechanics are in alignment with your values. And I don't mean the policy documents. I mean the design standards. I mean the standard operating procedures. I mean the traffic signal warrants, transportation performance metrics, the um, uh, whatever analysis you have for new development, all of that stuff, you need to make sure that all of the rules that city bureaucrats uh, are, are using every day are in alignment with your values. And I've only been here for 12 hours, and I can probably tell you, I can tell you with some confidence, that most of the rules that city bureaucrats are required to follow are profoundly misaligned with your city's values. And this puts them in an impossible position. They can't succeed, right? They're really frustrated, and people are angry. So looking very carefully at all of that and making sure that you've got alignment, where you start with clear values, you translate that into goals, into objectives that are actually achievable, into strategies that are tied to uh, your work programs for staff that can implement the objectives, most importantly, to performance metrics. If you can't measure it, it might as well not exist. So making sure that you've got a perfect alignment between performance metrics and values is a big challenge. Right now, your city traffic engineer, he's told that his job is eliminating seconds delay that cars experience at intersections in the peak 15 minutes of the peak hour. That's his only responsibility, the only thing that he's measured for. And that is not in alignment with your city's values. So your poor engineer is, at, is being asked to do something that one, he can't really do, and two, is getting in the way of everything else that you're trying to do. So be clear about your measures, and then also, perhaps even more importantly than this, is to make sure that your budget reflects all of the above. The most profound statement of values in any community is not their fancy policy documents, it's the budget. 
Um, so if your starting place for developing your citywide budget is copying last year's budget, you're probably not doing a clear values analysis that focuses on outcomes in order to make sure that you're spending money in the right place. It's really hard work. And then finally, from all of this, in order to build trust, collect data on your performance metrics and on your budget performance and report back to your citizens and to your council about how well your city government is doing in investing limited tax dollars to achieve the city's values. And this means being fearless about failure. It's something that we don't teach people in the public sector how to do well. Um, admitting when you fail and then <coughs> describing the lesson that you have learned and what you're doing to correct that. Um, if city government does nothing other than like say everything is good, you know things are not good, right? That doesn't build trust. Being really transparent about what's working well and what's not and what you're doing to fix that, that's the game here. Um, and if it comes to parking, um, I think we can do a lot better in making this whole sequence of events work. So that's my, I don't know how long I've been talking for, way too long. Uh, that's an over an hour about parking. Um, you've been a great audience, and I am here for as many questions as you would like to ask. Thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. two, the first two questions at the back. Great start. One is, what do we do with all the extra parking that we have, for example, along Broadway between 3rd and 11? 2,000 empty parking spaces. The other thing was, I heard you were going to talk about health as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, so the, the structure, of, like the empty structured parking spaces that you've got, that's a really valuable asset. So the question is, how do you unlock the big buildings that are adjacent to those parking facilities um, in order to allow folks to move into those buildings? Because the parking's already there, right? That's a huge cost savings for any developer. Um, and you know, it's part of the market sequencing challenge that you've got here in Wichita. You've got these sort of episodic little pockets of your city that are thriving, but disconnected from one another, right? And you have, in many ways, the fortune that you know Wichita and Kansas tend to be a kind of slow and steady economy. Right on the West Coast, we we go through these wild market swings of boom and bust. So it's okay if you've got some giant white elephant that's sitting out there being wasted, if that's not the right place to be focusing development. So always make sure that you're spending your energy cultivating the places that are ripest for success and then incrementally building on that, don't spread the peanut butter out too thin, <laughs> right? It's, it's, a, it's a big concern, particularly here, given how spread out, like your, your downtown is huge compared to the amount of vibrancy that is here. So I don't know, like, I, I'm just a parking guy. Uh, and yet all I'm talking about is downtown development. Um, so help, yeah. Um, so it's funny, uh, I was, uh, uh, Becky, Betsy, what's your, yeah. I was talking to uh, Becky and some of the other public health people earlier. Um, when we're talking about public health, we, we rarely actually use the words public health. Uh, because, uh, you know, as you said, it's like, you know, telling people to eat their broccoli. Um, so what I talk about is creating um, places that make people happy. Uh, and that means creating walkable, sociable, convivial, economically successful places. Um, if you create great places, um, people walk. Um, we are like bipedal primates. Like our bodies are designed to do that, but only when we feel safe and comfortable and particularly when it's sociable and interesting. Um, you know, Americans spend billions of dollars a year flying to places like Disneyland or to Paris um, to spend the entire day doing nothing but walking around. <laughs> and then they come back to Wichita and they say, oh, I wouldn't walk a block to parking. Like, that's outrageous. How could you make me do that? <laughs> uh, 
It's because we've made the environment punishing. They, you made the environment strip away my social status and make me a little concerned about my personal security. So I talk a lot about not just parking, but things like street trees. Um, like the most cost-effective investment that you can make in any downtown is planting the silly street trees. Like, don't do the fancy pavers, waste of money. Uh, don't do banners. Like, you, know, you can do the banners, they're not that expensive. Plant trees. People like trees. Trees give shade. It's hot in the summertime. Yes, the utility people will complain, but the math is really clear that the net value that trees create far exceeds the cost of uh, protecting utilities from tree roots. So just make sure that your utility people are made whole. <coughs> Um, so, and it also, it's super important for parking, because in order to make any downtown work, like if I've got a building and a parking space and a building and a parking space, it's a miserable place, it's gonna fail economically. Uh, in order to make a downtown work, you've got to share parking, and some of it's gonna be two or three blocks away. And having an unrelentingly high quality walking experience is the starting place for any great place, whether it's a great downtown, or a great neighborhood commercial district, or a great residential neighborhood. That's the common element. And if you can make a place unrelentingly delightful to walk in, I promise you it will work for every other mode of transportation. Never, ever sacrifice the quality of the walking experience in order to like meet some weird level of service threshold for the year 2035, like we know how many cars are going to be out there in 2035. Like, make it great to walk in, and everything else will fall into place. So, yeah, I, I talk about designing communities so that we get our required 10,000 daily steps without ever thinking about it. Because if you expect people to drive to the gym and walk on the treadmill as the way to get the basic needs of their body met, you are condemning your entire community to bad health. Um, I mean, Wichita probably knocks about 10 years off the lifespan of its residents through its transportation policies and programs. I mean, I, you know, I, 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 don't, I haven't read the statistics here, but if it's like a lot of communities that I work in. Um, in Oakland, I knocked 15 years off the lifespan of low-income children growing up in Oakland um, because of transportation, because of the pollutants that I made them breathe, uh, because I was running them down with cars, uh, because our poor people live near freeway interchanges, um, and because I um, denied them the opportunity to walk and bike to school. That was my responsibility. Um, I know that as a transportation professional, my four physician friends remind me that I have more control over public health outcomes as a transportation professional than the medical industry does. The medical industry there is there to clean up the mess that my industry created. Um, you know, it's a it's pretty simple fact. I mean, the, the epidemiological studies are really stark. And um, yeah, accepting our responsibility for that is important. Um, it's, you know, it's funny, one of the things I realized when I was uh, running the Oakland Department of Transportation was that, um, I had more control over economic development than the economic development department did. I had more control over housing affordability than our housing authority did. I had more control over public health outcomes than our you know, medical centers did. Um, I had more control over social equity than our human services department did. Um, one thing that I had no control over was congestion. What was the one thing that I was being asked to measure? Congestion. <laughs> Um, the one thing that I couldn't do anything about, like we could have shut down all economic development in Oakland and still had exactly the same amount of traffic congestion. Um, congestion is an economic problem. It is not an infrastructure problem. Congestion is simply what happens when the demand for mobility equals the supply. And it's only susceptible to economic solutions. And there are two. You can either destroy your economy, which Detroit did successfully. <laughs> a lot less congestion in Detroit. John Hill right? Or you can price, right? It's just an economic problem. 
All right, uh, other questions? Those are good ones. Oh, come on, it's parking. <laughs> <laughs> on the corner of 3rd and Elm, there's this weird guy that parks in front of my store. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm the performance metrics guy for the MPO, so I will ask you a very geeky friend. Good, good, good. Um, what sort of performance measures have you seen uh, other cities and metro areas using that support these kinds of, of goals and values? Um, so at the parking level or at the macro level? Both. Okay. Well, so for parking, um, the most important performance metric is uh, uh, sales tax return. Right, for any Main Street, the only transportation performance metric that matters is sales tax returns. And you should be collecting sales tax returns um, quarterly at the very least, and you should be um, mapping them down to the block level if you can. Uh, that, that's the, like, I'm in the real estate value business. That's the, our primary function. Um, and that is how we should judge Main Street projects. Um, uh, another thing that we're increasingly doing a better job at um, analyzing is how many jobs are within a 20 minute commute of our low income households. And are those jobs um, actually suitable for the skills of that community? Um, so social equity is uh, increasingly important um, in a lot of cities and challenging to measure. So measuring it based upon um, job accessibility as well, not just the time, but the cost of that job accessibility uh, so that we can use our transportation investments to expand opportunity for people who've been left behind. And this is increasingly important, not just for thinking about social equity and for correcting the sins of my industry. <coughs> right? I mean, you know, um, it wasn't that long ago where my, in my industry, like if we were doing a new highway project or a road widening, we got extra points for eliminating blight in our road project. Like that sounds good, like we're eliminating blight, awesome. How is blight defined? Oh, African American ownership. Um, so there are many examples where highway projects veer out of their way, like you know, would have been most sensible for it to go like this, but it veers out of its way just to wipe out a former African-American owned commercial district because you got extra points in your funding formula. Um, so we, like, we have a kind of problematic history. Um, we've systematically, in my industry, stripped away economic capital from people of color, um, quite intentionally. Um, the, a lot more has been written about how um, you know, Fannie Mae, housing policy, and the mortgage industry have done that. Less is written about how the transportation industry was a key partner um, in those efforts. So knowing that history and correcting for it is good. Um, but another argument to be looking at social equity is one about economic competitiveness. So we're living in an increasingly cutthroat, economically competitive world. And if we're not tapping into um, the um, entrepreneurialism of all of our residents, we're denying our regions the ability to compete effectively, right? Regions that you know are only allowing men to compete in the workplace, or you know only uh, like denying people of color that opportunity, they're losing their competitive edge, and so white affluent people in high economically performing areas are increasingly realizing how completely dependent they are in entrepreneurialism uh, among people of color and women uh, in order to compete against China or compete against the other region down the interstate. Um, so thinking about how to quantify measures of equity and um, economic participation um, are really fun at the MPO level. Um, there's not there's lots of conversation going on about that. I don't think anyone's got it perfect yet. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, CO2, it's an important issue, uh, particularly if you're here in Kansas and having the 100th meridian move over to the 98th has profound economic implications for a state like Kansas. 
So what's your role in reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Um, might not be politically popular at the state level to talk about that, but starting to quantify it at the city and MPO level um, can be useful. <coughs> um, uh, certainly stuff that we look at. Um, other things that are really important are about financial sustainability. So we notice that there's a lot of road building going on here in this region and a lot of roadway deferred maintenance. So you've got a situation where the region is living on its, off its credit cards for its daily expenses while it's off like buying a new Mercedes. Um, that's, that's not a good setup for long-term economic success. So quantifying um, the, your deferred maintenance situation as well as how your new capital investments help or hurt your ability to maintain the overall system. Um, certainly measuring um, the infrastructure cost per capita. So as the city spreads faster than it's growing in terms of population or jobs, your ratio of infrastructure cost to population and jobs uh, is increasing at a time when your finances are decreasing. Um, that's like if you were doing that as a household, you'd be setting yourself up for bankruptcy. So, like really focusing on fiscal good stewardship um, in your capital plan, super important. And particularly for your capital plan, like how is your capital? How are you using your capital plan to reduce your operating costs? Yeah. Good question. You showed a slide of several cities that have eliminated their parking requirements. Yeah. How do they go about doing that? Oh yeah. Well, that's really risky. Like, uh, if you're if you're the mayor who's like proposing that, you need to be prepared that this is going to be your last term as mayor. <laughs> <laughs> um, although in most of these cities, actually, it ended up working out fine in the end, surprisingly. Um, but it's incredibly controversial. Um, none of these cities who've gone through this just decided, oh yeah, yeah, hey George, like do you think we should just eliminate these requirements we've had for 50 years? Yeah, it's probably be fine, I'm sure nobody will notice. Um, no, they've, they've gone through long community-based planning processes, and for most of them, they did it incrementally. Um, Buffalo is the weird outlier that just said, this is insane. Why on earth are we forcing anyone to build parking when we have like five times as much parking as we'll ever need? And they just like like, we're, we're done. Like, get rid of all. And they did it all at once. Most places have, have done it actually like Wichita's doing it, which is to start and then sort of incrementally, like, go uh, start in the downtown and go to the commercial districts and make adjustments over time. Um, and they've done it by kind of going through something like this really, really incredibly long, tedious lecture, um, which is hard to do with neighborhood people. Like, at most, you get, like, three minutes. People have a three minute attention span. It's hard to talk about all this stuff in three minutes. And our instinct is like, oh, parking's a hassle. Surely more parking will solve my problems. It's sort of like I'm sitting in traffic, and if only there were another lane over there, then like my problem would be solved and I could drive fast. People have a hard time with systems thinking and thinking through the unintended consequences of actions. That's the challenge. Yes? Did they get rid of also any requirements for handicap parking? Um, so they, um, so handicap, handicap parking requirement is done through management, right? So there are management requirements where for the parking that exists, you need to make sure that the closest available spaces are reserved for people with disabilities, right? Because that's what you know people with disabilities need. They don't need like a certain supply. They need the closest space so that they can participate fully in society. Um, you know, even though it may be difficult for them to um, walk or wheel on um, long distances. Other questions? Um, is parking easy in Wichita? Yes. Yes. When, when is parking hard in Wichita? When people double park. When people double park? Just because they're in your way and you got to maneuver around. Special events. Okay. Special events, yeah. Yeah, although uh, parking should be hard at special events. We were having a conversation earlier about, you. like, you're fortunate you've got all these event centers, like, really close in. Um, a lot of cities make a terrible mistake of having dedicated parking attached to their stadium or their arena or their convention center. 
what happens then is that people like come in from the suburbs, like they all drive in at the same time, there's like kind of traffic chaos, they all pile into the garage and spiral up, and they park and they go and do the thing, and then it's over, and they all come out at exactly the same time, and then they all try to leave at exactly the same time. So there's traffic chaos. Um, the cities that get the greatest return on their event center investments are the ones that distribute the parking and take advantage of that underutilized office uh, you know, and you know, other parking and force people to walk a couple blocks, most importantly, get people to walk a couple blocks past bars and restaurants. <laughs> you make your money not off of ticket sales, you make your money off of food and beverage sales. That's how, you know, I mean, that, that's the economy of, of even if you're just running the stadium. Right? The San Francisco Giants don't make money off of their very expensive tickets. They make it off of food and beverage. Uh, and so thinking about distributing your parking and placing uh, stuff in between the parking and the stadium, um, not only do you get better spending, but you spread out the, um, the after event traffic both geographically and by time. Um, and not only does that re result in less traffic, it results in a far better fan or concert goer experience. People have a lot better time. And this is true like in study after study after study. Like people then end up making a day of it and discovering like how awesome downtown Wichita is because like there's so many things to do. Yeah. Alright, anything else? Yes? Let's keep this time, but when they were showing you around, did they show you the Broadway Auto Park apartments? Yes, I was so excited about that. <laughs> now I love creative reuse of parking garages. In downtown Austin, there are two like speakeasy bars hidden inside municipal parking structures. Yeah, I completely nerd out about stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, no, there's also like there's a lot of cities like uh, um, many so you know garages in the 1920s and the 1930s tended to be very grand affairs and usually had level floors and you know beautiful spiral ramp. Um, and a lot of them are being retrofitted into other uses around the country. Um, when I was working in Oakland, uh, well, when I was working in Oakland, we sold off two of our municipal parking structures because they were underutilized. Like the, the, the demand was falling uh, and they were much more valuable as residential. And a couple of private garages got uh, converted into luxury condos. Like it's a, it's a great trend that's really helping um, struggling downtown suburbs. All right. Well, thank you all. I can't believe you stayed. Congratulations on living in a really interesting city at a perfectly challenging time.